Good evening or good morning. I think uh, we can start, right? Um, okay, I would uh, like to request Ambassador Virendra Gupta to start the proceedings. Thank you, Ambassador Patnaik. Um, I welcome um, all of you, um, our distinguished delegates. In particular, I'd like to uh, welcome our guest of honor, uh, Honorable Dr. Vindhya Vasini Prasad, uh, Minister of Human Services and Social Security in the uh, Government of Guyana. Uh, our uh, Chief Guest, uh, Honorable Minister of State in the Government of India for External Affairs, Sri Murli Dharan, and uh, the President of uh, ICCR, uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Vinay Sahasra Budde. Um, and uh, many um, distinguished uh, delegates who would be participating in the second segment of uh, this uh, conference, uh, mini conference, regional PVD, but uh, extremely important conference, which will feed into uh, the uh, Pravasi Bharati Adivas uh, Convention to be held in uh, January 2021. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this conference uh, has been organized uh, uh, jointly by Ministry of External Affairs, ICCR, Indian Council for Cultural Relations, and Antarashtriya Sahyog Parishad. And the theme as a subject is the role of Indian diaspora in promotion of Indian culture abroad. It seems such an obvious subject because Indian diaspora has been uh, providing human service in the cause of promoting Indian culture abroad. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, the great honor that has been bestowed on ARSP. Uh, and this is in recognition of um, uh, the untiring work that our organization has done, particularly led by our former Secretary General, uh, Baleshwar Agrawalji, in expanding our um, outreach uh, and interface with the Indian diaspora. Uh, I think he, he was very passionate towards connecting with the Indian diaspora and it was largely due to his efforts that the um, government of India finally uh, recognized the need for uh, uh, instituting uh, formal mechanisms uh, and um, instituted the Pravasi Bharti Divas uh, um, to um, celebrate um, uh, the uh, close association that we have with the um, diaspora. Uh, so we'll begin uh, the session uh, today uh, with uh, the welcome address by uh, Honorable Dr. Vinay Sinisaputin. Since we are experiencing some technical difficulties, um, okay, starting, all right. Ambassador Gupta ji, signatories uh, on the dais, Honorable Minister of State for External Affairs, Shri V. Murli Dharanji, His Excellency Shri Avinash Tilluk, Minister for Arts and Culture heritage of the government of Mauritius, distinguished chair and moderator, Ambassador Shashank, Ambassador uh, Virendra Gupta, we just heard, but other office bearers as well of the Antarashtriya Sahayog Parishad, distinguished uh, experts, speakers from abroad and India as well, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be amongst all of you 
although in a virtual format. But uh, I am really happy that the Pravasi Bharatiya Divas this year is uh, happening as a culmination of several conferences, kind of, or brainstorming sessions. And one of them is uh, here, which is being organized by the Indian Council for Cultural Relations. And the subject is also something which is uh, very, very critical, and it is about the role of diaspora in promotion of Indian culture abroad. Well, friends, uh, I have only three, four points to be met as a part of my welcome remarks. At the outset, let me welcome you all and also thank you for having taken out time to participate in this important uh, churning of ideas. I am also grateful to our uh, Union Minister of State for External Affairs, Sri Murli Dharanji, for uh, gracing this uh, important conference. All my colleagues in the ICCR, including our Director General, Sri Dinesh Patnaik, and all others are also present here, and uh, all their efforts, I am sure, with your equally vibrant participation are going to help us in achieving the objective. Friends, uh, I'm really confused whether the term diaspora should be used or not, because uh, there are uh, various uh, opinions about that, but I've been using it I continue with that and put uh, as a part of my welcome remarks reflect three points. First of all, although the title suggests what could be the role of diaspora in promotion of Indian culture abroad, my take on this is that whether the diaspora actively promotes Indian culture or not, at least I'm sure it has been and it will, in a more effective manner, contribute in creating the understanding of Indian culture. Because every country has its own uh, cultural, civilizational background, and whether Indian culture as such could be promoted in a foreign atmosphere or not. But what is essential, in keeping with the spirit of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, or the world is a family, is that we need to understand the nuances of Indian culture and make our fellow countrymen, wherever we are staying, understand what exactly is the idea of India, Indian culture, Indian civilization, and Indian people as well. And to that end, I believe, for the diaspora people, there are several things to do. And in that context, I think, uh, whether we can start with exploring the idea of preparing some kind of an index of the understanding about India in a particular country or in countries wherever we are currently staying. What exactly is the, is the in, on this index, where exactly do a particular country stands, whether uh, it is high on that index or it is low on that index. And if it is low, how can we enhance understanding and bring that particular country, the, the particular society there, a little above on that index, a little up on that index. It's something which is for all of us to decide. Because uh, although in India, a separate branch of uh, knowledge, a discipline like diaspora studies, is not so very cultivated. I would uh, urge all those who are into academia that they should also explore the idea of evolving this particular discipline within India itself as to what exactly are the diasporas doing in their countries, how they have contributed, and what exactly are the social and cultural issues that are affecting the diaspora societies, diaspora communities. And in that way, if we cultivate this uh, diaspora studies 
as an independent discipline, a sociological discipline, I am sure we can reflect more precisely in a more focused manner on the issues at hand. In the context of the index of understanding of India, if at all we are able to evolve that, how can we enhance that understanding remains the focused agenda. And in that context, I believe there are at least uh, four things which uh, all members of the diaspora communities can certainly do. Firstly, enhancing interaction with the local communities so that through our interactions, through our uh, dialogues, through our community gatherings, through our participatory approach in the local communities, we can enhance the level of understanding about Indian culture in the countries wherever we are. That is point number one. Point number two, we have to engage in a more effective manner with the local media. I don't know whether the local media gives adequate importance to Indian diaspora and the activities by Indian diaspora, thereby India as a country and Indian society as well. This is also extremely critical. Recently, ICCR undertook a kind of a study of various textbooks in different countries. And there are several revelations which should uh, make us sit up and think about. And in that context, I believe, enhancing the level of India literacy, media, since it plays a key role, I think our engagement with local media, whether TV channels, social media, or mainstream media, it's something very, very critical. And I would urge upon all the honorable members who are participating in this conference to focus on this as well. The third, and perhaps more important, is our more meaningful, effective, and proactive engagement with the academia in our countries, whether universities, whether teaching communities, whether those who are uh, on various bodies of universities and think tanks as well, interaction with is also extremely important. But the opinion making that takes shape through academia in, and in that context also, we can evolve a kind of an agenda as to how do we make India something which is properly understood by the members of the academia in our country as well. Lastly, our interaction with the local civil society. Civil society is a comparatively new phenomenon, but I think their role in opinion making is something very, very important. And therefore, whether issues like development, whether issues, sociological issues, whether uh, uh, issues uh, pertaining to uh, the Indian civilization, Indian culture, the more we interact with local civil society people, the greater is going to be the benefit for the diaspora communities. I would suggest that during the day-long deliberations today, members of the diaspora communities who are participating in this important conference would definitely take all these points also into consideration. Insofar as ICCR is concerned, we have several uh, measures that uh, would enhance our interaction with the diaspora communities. We are now going to have a separate uh, up, uh, an independent approach for greater participation of diaspora communities in Indian cultural centers abroad. Most of them are now known as Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center, as we are all aware of. And therefore, I would definitely suggest all of you also to come out with a set of suggestions for ICCR to work upon. Once again, I extend a warm welcome to Honorable Minister of State for External Affairs, Sri Murli Dharanji, and all other dignitaries who are participating in this important conference. Thank you very much. Namaste. I thank um, Dr. Vanessa Sabudhi for his important uh, remarks.
Uh, he referred to the role of diaspora, not only in promoting and propagating Indian culture abroad, but also in creating understanding of India and understanding of Indian culture. And I think these are both interrelated uh, issues, and I'm sure our conference would deliberate on these very important issues. Uh, one thing is obvious that uh, for uh, enhancing the role of the diaspora, communities, um, there will need to be greater coordination and communication between the diaspora organizations and government of India uh, organizations. Uh, I think the other point that you made about um, uh, strengthening diaspora studies uh, at the academic level in India is also extremely relevant. In fact, uh, it is in keeping with the need for uh, this sort of thing that we set up uh, an academic unit within Antarashtriya Sayog Parishad uh, by the name of uh, Diaspora Research and Resources Center. It's been functioning for the last three years and it has helped us to undertake uh, research activities, um, uh, data collection, uh, and it's kind of a fulcrum for academic activities. Uh, and I want to acknowledge at this stage the support that we've been receiving from the External Affairs Ministry for um, this unit. Um, I should also add uh, that um, our Honorable President of ICCR uh, has been uh, very active in uh, politics um, from his early days uh, as a student activist to begin with. Uh, he's a member of parliament and national vice president of the ruling uh, Bharatiya Janata Party. Uh, he's been involved with the training, uh, and that's a unique uh, aspect that he's been dealing with, uh, training of um, the uh, elected representatives and voluntary social workers. Uh, at this stage, I'd like to um, uh, invite uh, our guest of honor, Dr. Vindhya Vasini Prasad, uh, Minister of Human Resource, Human Services and Social Security in the newly elected government of Guyana. I want to first of all congratulate you for um, uh, the um, institution of your government uh, uh, despite so many difficulties which we were closely following. Uh, Dr. Prashad is a multifaceted uh, personality, extremely accomplished. Uh, she is a doctor by profession, a physician by profession, profession uh, taught at the University of Guyana School of Medicine. Uh, she uh, is also a Kathmandu dancer, and uh, she hosts a number of uh, television programs featuring uh, Indian culture um, and uh, a radio program. Uh, so I think uh, given that kind of talent and um, multifaceted personality um, she brings to uh, bear uh, in her responsibility as the um, Minister for Human Resources, Human Services and Social Security, we are greatly honoured to have you, ma'am, uh, in our conference and I'd like to invite you to please uh, make your um, remarks. Thank you very much, Ambassador Gupta. Minister of State, Sri Murli Dharan, President of ICCR, Dr. Sahastra Budhe, other distinguished guests and presenters, and also representatives from ARSP. I thank you for hosting or collaborating to make this a reality. It is my pleasure to be here, to be a part of a very important conversation, which I think needs to continue because the diaspora is far reaching. On behalf of the government of Guyana, I thank you for your good wishes. And we have endured much and we are here ready to represent and work with all the peoples of Guyana. And as you know, culture is something that defines all of us. Culture also helps us to network, to link and to create friendships, families and to bring communities together. Indian culture has been in Guyana for a number of years with the advent of our foreparents to these shores, then called British Guyana. Culture in terms of the Indian context as such would have evolved. Culture in Guyana is also very closely linked to faith and belief. And I will proudly say in Guyana, we have a kaleidoscope of cultures from all the peoples of our country. And one of the beautiful things of my country is that we have the unique distinction of 
celebrating each other's culture, sharing each other's culture. And I'd like to invite all of you who are here on this panel to visit our beautiful country of Guyana and to experience what our culture is like. It is a very, very different experience because you would find whenever there is Pagwa or Holi, whenever there is Diwali in Guyana, people in their thousands will come out on the streets and marvel at something, again, that is very distinctive of Guyana called our Diwali motorcade. And I wear another hat as the president of the Guyana Hindu Dharmic Sabha. And we have for well over four decades being hosting the Diwali motorcade, which brings art forms together in the sense there is creation of masterpieces where we have the representation of various deities and people line and throng the streets of our country to look at this. We also are very much involved in our country in development of the arts. And I want to recognize ICCR in a recent decision that was shared with me by our high commissioner here, that representation that we have made at length to have more scholarships for our country and this part of the world, we are going to have that happen for culture and art forms. And I want to, at this point in time, say how important that is because there are many countries like us where the enthusiasm is high. People want to learn music, they want to learn dance, they want to also learn those skills at a very high level and be able to share it with much of the country. We have for a number of years through the Ghana Hindu Dharmic Sabha and also the Indian Cultural Center here, we have been pretty much the bedrock of ensuring the sustenance, the promotion, and the propagation of art forms in Guyana, notably music and dance. We have crafted a festival of art called Kala Utsav, and hundreds of young people from across our country participate each year, and they do so in classical dance, folk dance, Hindi, Ramayan chanting, Ram Leela excerpts, as well as music, kirtans, just to name a few. This is our effort to relate to what was said before me of engaging the community. And young people look forward to this annual event every year. And what we've seen happen from this initial stage of exposure is young people progressing in various disciplines. Even though they might migrate to other countries, they continue their journey in their various art forms. And I think that's what we want because the arts and culture is an expression that can transcend boundaries. So we definitely, through the utilization of culture and art, we have the opportunity to be a part of the movement called edutainment in as we have messaging that can be very, very relevant to our world in which we live, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's gender-based violence. And the reason I'm saying this is because right now in the world, we are all part of 16 days of activism to deal with gender-based violence. So we have utilized the arts in this way to send that message across our country so you can understand why culture is so near and dear to us. Being someone who has been raised in this kind of culture, I appreciate the value that it brings to our people. I appreciate what we can recognize in every facet of our land. Culture resides in the food that we eat. Curries are very much a part of our national cuisine. We also see representation of facets of culture in our fashion sense and the way in which we dress. But more importantly, it is music that would have kept the connection between Guyana and India. Why I say this is because even though the language is not widely spoken, some people still learn the language. We promote it from the Guyana Hindu Dharmic Sabha point of view, Sanskrit and Hindi. And we've been able to send people to access scholarships through your programs, and they come back and they teach others. Through the COVID pandemic, they were able to share Hindi knowledge, Sanskrit knowledge through virtual classrooms and platforms, because we believe that even though we may have to adjust to what the pandemic has done to the world, we must not stop sharing and teaching all the different dimensions of our culture. So wherever you go in our country, you will be able to appreciate the presence of culture here. 
But I do believe of great importance that more emphasis should be placed in countries like ours. We need to be engaged to find out what are our needs. What I can say from my end, we need more teachers. We need more online platforms. We need more cultural exchanges specific to culture in the sense that we can share and you can share so that it grows and it is visible and evident in all parts of our land. The interest is high. Young people are willing to be part of this movement to promote Indian culture. And while we have established it here very firmly, I think there is space and need for growth. I also believe in addition to teachers and teaching facilities, we must have conversations where we can develop platforms to enhance and promote performances where in parts of the world like us, where the language might not be as there as we would want it to be, we can still express what we know, what we have developed, what we have honed, and we can have platforms that all countries can share on these platforms what we do in terms of Indian culture. They need to be consistent, they need to be shared with a wider section of the world, and we definitely need to ensure that at all times, the dialogue that is started today continues. If we are to effectively promote culture, we need to also engage young people. Culture is lost when the generations next are not involved in that dialogue. I know sometimes facets of culture disappear completely because young people are not following the footsteps of their four parents. So we need to have dialogues where young people in particular are engaged to express themselves on what they think culture means to them, where they think culture should go, and definitely how they think they want to be part of a cultural movement. So there are areas that can definitely improve from input, from suggestions, and from recommendations. And I hope that we will see coming out of this conference tangible measures to address all that I've shared with you. But I'd like to applaud members and distinguished guests from the diaspora for keeping culture alive, because many times we would have kept it alive by ourselves with not enough support from India. While the support has come later on and the support, I hope, will grow, I would like to see more of this happen. We were in Guyana very fortunate to receive in 2019 the award from the President of India. And we are extremely appreciative that our efforts have been recognized in the promotion and sustenance of culture in Guyana. But I do believe that much, much more can be done. And if there is a network that is created, a cultural and arts network that is created among all of the countries of the diaspora, then I think sharing will become easier for us to definitely respond to each other and to develop that framework of family that we speak of. Because I, I firmly believe that a family is linked by its cultural identity. So I want to really appreciate my thanks to all of you for having me here today, for allowing me to share with you my thoughts on culture and the promotion of Indian culture. And for Indian culture to be promoted, it is imperative too that we look at the language in which it is promoted. So many of the countries in the diaspora, they speak many languages. So if we have language familiarity or language sensitization where culture could be promoted in the language the people speaking, I think they will relate better to it. And while COVID has hit us very, very hard and the world is reeling under the impact of COVID, people still retreat to the familiar shelter of their culture to find some solace. So more than ever, now is the time to share that culture. More than ever, now is the time for us to have these discussions. So when the world returns to some semblance of normalcy, we can see this explosion of culture that you and I would like to see. But 
for all of this to happen, the support has to be there. And you're probably thinking that I'm emphasizing this support because we do want it. We do want it. And sometimes the bigger countries benefit much more than we do. But don't forget, the countries in this part of the world, they hold culture very near and dear to them. So as I move to the conclusion of what I'm going to, sh to say, I want to once again invite you to my country, experience holy as we have definitely embraced it as a country, experience Diwali in Guyana, experience any of the other facets of your culture that has become a part of our culture through our whole ideology of the land of six peoples and with six peoples come six cultures. So we have managed to amalgamate all of the cultures of various parts of the world, and that has become our identity of Guyanese culture. But you will not, I will tell you, you will not be disappointed with what you find. And many people who visit our lovely land of Guyana say to us, especially from India, they don't feel as if they're away from home. So having said that, I want to again say thank you on behalf of the government of Guyana. And we look forward to continuing to build the strong on the strong relationship that we share and look in ways in which we can expand on that relationship and where more can be done between the two countries so that there can be more of the facets of Indian culture that our people of Guyana enjoy, embrace and recognize. Once again, I thank you on behalf of the government of Guyana and I wish this conference every success and may all that we see and all that we do materialize in a very fruitful and productive outcomes. I thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Minister, for your very warm sentiments uh, towards India. Thank you also for reminding us that uh, culture helps to connect and network uh, and um, create this kind of fusion, um, helps bring people together, create better understanding. Um, I think Guyana, like many countries, including India, is a multicultural society. And uh, I think uh, you have to be there to see the rainbow of um, cultural activities. You gave a little glimpse of what is going on, um, various cultural practices. I forgot to uh, inform our audience that uh, apart from your many accomplishments and many things that you do, you're also president of Hindu Dharmic Sabha. And uh, in that capacity, you have been personally responsible for um, undertaking the developing of cultural activities. We do recognize that in many of the diaspora countries, uh, cultural activities are often undertaken by um, socio-religious organizations. So I think uh, the Hindu Dharmic Sabha must be playing a very important role. So I want to thank you. And I also thank you for uh, making a reference to connecting with young people, because um, a, an important element of our uh, conference today is um, engaging the youth. So I'm sure uh, the points that you made, the suggestions you made, would uh, be taken uh, into account by uh, during the course of our deliberations. At this stage, <clears throat> I'd like to invite our chief guest, um, Honorable um, Shri Murli Dharan, uh, Minister of State for External Affairs. Um, Shri Murli Dharan um, uh, took charge as Minister of State for External Affairs in May 2019. Uh, he has been an activist in socio-political affairs in Kerala uh, from the early days and has held um, various um, senior positions in Nehru Yuva Kendra. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, Honorable Minister of State to make his uh, inaugural address. His Excellency, uh, Mr. Avinas Tilak, Honorable Minister of Arts and Cultural Heritage, Government of Mauritius, who has addressed this uh, virtual conference. Her Excellency, Dr. Vindhya Vasini Persad, Honorable Minister and Member of Parliament, Government of Guyana, who will be addressing the second session in the afternoon. Dr. Vinay Sahasrabade, President of Indian Council for Cultural Relations. Sri Sanjay Bhattacharya, Secretary, CPV and OIA. Sri Dinesh Patnaik, Director General, ICCR. 
Ambassador Virendra Gupta, President, uh, Antarashtriya Sahayog Parishad, who has been coordinating this uh, um, morning session. Distinguished chairpersons of the technical sessions, distinguished experts from abroad and India, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to welcome you all to this virtual conference on the important subject of role of diaspora in promotion of Indian culture abroad, being jointly organized by the Indian Council for Cultural Relations and the Overseas Indian Affairs Division of the Ministry of External Affairs in partnership with the Diaspora Research and Resource Center, Andarashtriya Sahayog Parishad. This conference constitutes an important part of the annual flagship Pravasi Bharatiya Divas 2021. Through such an initiative, we celebrate our extended family that is residing all across the world and is in true spirit ambassadors of the great culture of our country. We are proud of the fascinating story of the Indian diaspora, starting from the ancient times and never looking back, reaching the current stage where we have over 30 million strong Indian diaspora spread over in more than 100 countries. In the present time, Indian diasporas have emerged as a powerful entity since they are recognized as soft power in the realm of foreign policy strategy and also as an agent or catalyst of economic development of countries of origin besides the active role in the host country. The Indian diaspora is the second largest diaspora in the world and is counted among the most successful expat communities anywhere in the world. Today, they occupy high positions in the field of politics, economy, industry, technology, and education. This heterogeneous group, drawn from different historical and cultural contexts of migration, are identified and held together by their Indianness and a deep cultural and emotional attachment towards Mother India. The success stories of our diaspora are countless. We all recount the recent electoral victories worldwide, and I would like to recall the formations of government under His Excellency President Irfan Ali in Guyana and His Excellency President Chandrika Prasad Santoki in Suriname. Indian origin leaders have also done exceptionally well at the recently held elections in the United States. Vice President-elect her Excellency Ms. Kamala Harris with family roots in India is the first woman to reach the apex of power in the US. There are leaders of Indian origin in the Congress, Senate, and scores have won seats in the state legislatures in the USA. We are all proud of their victories. Congratulate them and wish them all success. The Indian diaspora living abroad has provided a global identity to India as a land of flavors, rich heritage through its music, dance, cinema, etc. And they have been in the forefront in passing Indian traditions, culture, values, morals, and mores from one generation to another. They have also encouraged their host country to adopt many aspects of Indian culture and heritage. India is recognized internationally for its intellect, scientific temper, way of life through Ayurveda, yoga, amongst many such examples. While diasporas have seamlessly integrated with the countries of their adoption, they have also maintained very close links with their ethno-cultural roots in India. They have been bridges, mediators, facilitators, lobby and advocacy groups for taking primacy of India's national security and economic interests and soft power projection. With the collective efforts of 130 crore Indians, we embark on a new journey of hopes and aspirations. While India is moving ahead on the path of development at a rapid pace, the goodwill and support of our Indian diaspora abroad cannot be overemphasized. 
the government of India and the Indian society have always valued and appreciated the contribution of diaspora in enhancing India's position, prestige, and standing abroad. This long-standing partnership has culminated in strong two-way efforts and initiatives through a series of institutional and operational arrangements for greater mutual consultations, for improved synergy between the diaspora's expectations and the Government of India's policy framework. In this context, we may recall our extensive diaspora-specific programs, namely exchange programs, ICCR scholarships, youth exchanges, distinguished and academic, uh, academic visitors program of ICCR, ICCR sponsored asked artists in performing and visual arts, ICCR's academic programs through Indian Church for promoting Indic studies, Indian languages, Indian history and culture, Indian technical and economic cooperation program, that's the ITEC, cultural fest, Indian cultural centers abroad, and many more. The government programs and schemes have always been based on regular consultations with diaspora. And one of the most effective initiatives for this has been the Pravasi Bharatiya Divas. The next PBD is scheduled on 9th January 2021. And we are looking forward to receiving all of you again to carry forward this important dialogue. There is a definite advantage and charm of in-person interaction. However, the exceptional circumstances due to COVID-19 have forced us to go virtual. We were also looking forward to sharing with you in person the various policy initiatives for shaping the idea of new India, including the concept of Atmanir Bhar Bharat. We also wanted to share with you the impact of COVID-19 globally on India and specifically on diaspora and brief you on the initiatives taken by India for addressing this unprecedented challenge, including for softening its impact on Indian diaspora. However, our interactions will have to be through a virtual mode. The socio-economic influence, standing and expectations of the Indian diaspora have been evolving fast and it requires new and more effective tools of engagements. We are accordingly approaching this theme, that is the role of Indian diaspora in promotion of Indian culture abroad, with an open mind and are willing to discuss and explore the measures, including at the level of policy, institutional arrangements, and execution. In this session, we will look forward to listening to your views, your ideas, for refining these tools under the four sub-themes relating to cultural promotion, cultural exchange programs, culture as a vehicle of soft power, and engaging the youth. The Government of India Diaspora Partnership for Cultural Preservation and Promotion has worked very well. However, a significant share of cultural penetration abroad has been carried out essentially by the diaspora organizations. Building on this strength, a time seems to have come to explore new ways of further enhancing the diaspora's role in promotion and preservation of Indian culture abroad. We completely realize that the character, capacity, and needs of diaspora evolve with each generation, and this process has accelerated in the digital era. The interests, needs, and expectations of the youth are changing fast, and policy adaptations need to keep pace lest it's it causes any disconnect. Our objective is to make this government diaspora collaboration for cultural promotion abroad more effective, focused, and self-sustaining, with a special emphasis on engaging with the youth. Let the diaspora take a greater ownership of the process. Finally, I wish to profoundly thank the partner organizations for their support, and all of you for your valuable time and hope that the deliberations and discussions 
in the coming sessions would be fruitful and constructive. Thanking you all. I thank uh, the Minister of State for his inaugural address. And I think in a way, sir, you have set the tone for your discussions. Um, the Indian diaspora has played an important role, and I think Government of India acknowledging it um, would be very encouraging for the Indian diaspora organizations and Indian diaspora as a whole. I think the challenge is to um, identify a roadmap, explore new ways, as you said, of enhancing diaspora's role and in leveraging that capacity. Um, I think it has to be done both at the policy level and at practical execution level, as you have set out. Um, what is important um, is to is to recognize the the great role that they have been performing, uh, particularly in countries where there is the health aspect. Uh, they have the advantage of uh, the numbers. Um, if you if you look at a country like U.S. or uh, many Caribbean countries where the diaspora is very large in numbers, um, you know they they run hundreds and thousands of uh, schools of performing arts. They undertake so many programs um, that I think uh, it is very clear to me that in promoting our uh, soft power, in promoting our Indian culture abroad, um, Indian government or Indian government agencies cannot be the primary drivers. Um, we have to accept that the Indian diaspora and Indian diaspora organizations are the primary drivers and that government of India uh, is ready to play a supplemental role. Um, uh, I think uh, today, given the role of Indian diaspora in um, promoting um, Indian culture and through Indian culture soft power, uh, and also in promoting political understanding with countries, and we see that happen in so many different countries uh, between India and the, their adopted countries, I think somehow you see the Indian diaspora having ascended to a much higher level of uh, priority. Uh, I think, uh, as Minister said, uh, uh, they, they now uh, have become part of our um, policy framework. Uh, and a um, foreign policy priority. And I think uh, uh, that uh, makes us believe that uh, government of India will continue to uh, look for ways to strengthen that connection between uh, with the Indian diaspora and in particular in uh, leveraging uh, the strength and the outreach of the Indian diaspora in um, promoting India's soft power. Uh, so at this stage, um, I'd like to invite um, a very dynamic um, director general of ICCR, who's been the really the driving force uh, uh, for undertaking this very important conference. And um, I think under his charge, I must um, add that under his charge, ICCR is already uh, developing uh, programs uh, which would um, uh, seek to fully leverage uh, diaspora's strength in promoting Indian's culture. Dinesh, you have the floor. And Namaskar. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Ambassador Gupta, for having wonderfully moderated this session, uh, the morning session also. You were brilliant in your way and you approached the whole issues. But more than you, I would like to through you thank the Antarashtriya Sahyog Parishad, which has been doing a wonderful work uh, along with ICCR in reaching out to the diaspora and in doing a lot of activities with us, not just with the diaspora, but with Roma and other cultural activities. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the chief guest, uh, Sri Murli Dharan, uh, who has been leading India's uh, efforts at reaching out to the diaspora. He is actually leading by example from the front. And as his speech said, we need the diaspora to work much more with government to see how they can become a vehicle for or play a role in promotion of Indian culture abroad. I would like to thank my president, Dr. Vinay Sasabrude. Uh, who has been leading ICCR from the front. Uh, he has a special focus on the diaspora and has been initiating a lot of action where the diaspora is concerned. But most important, I would like to thank our guest of honor, Dr. Vindya Vasini Parsad. Um, she gave this brilliant idea of the cultural and arts network, uh, which is a very good idea. 
And if our ambassador is listening on this uh, conference, I would like to tell him that we need to take this forward because this is something which we have been thinking about in India of creating a network of all cultural and arts personalities across the world, not only to share ideas and to bring them all together, but also to see how we can take best practices from one place to another. This is a network which we had thought uh, originally to do with bilaterally with one country at a time, but I think a global cultural arts and uh, network would be a brilliant idea. Uh, we have an excellent lineup coming in the session, which is coming behind. We have Secretary CPV and OIA, uh, my good friend Sanjay Bhattacharya, who will be uh, uh, chairing the session. Uh, we're looking forward to more such ideas, like uh, Dr. Vindya Vasini Parsad said, because these ideas which come out of this session will be taken in account by us in strategizing and putting in a policy for greater role of diaspora abroad. But what I'd like to hear more is how can we use diaspora or how can diaspora be a vehicle for reaching out to communities abroad? We are already doing a lot for the diaspora. There's the Overseas Indian Division, which is active. ICCR has a lot that we do with the diaspora. But at the end, Indian culture, if it has to spread across the world, has to spread to other communities, other cultures. It, we cannot just keep on doing it among ourselves. So what I need ideas is how does the diaspora help in reaching Indian culture to cultures in their home country, so that this is spread across the world. So we are looking forward to a great session. Um, we will now take a little, I think, one minute break. Sanjay is online. Uh, Sanjay, I think uh, over to you for session two, where you'll have to chair. You have a brilliant list of speakers. So over to Sanjay Bhattacharya. Thank you very much. Namaskar, Pravasis. Namaskar, Pravasis. Good afternoon, good morning to our Indian diaspora across the Western Hemisphere. We had a very exciting session in the morning from the Eastern Hemisphere, and so now it's over to the West. And you have a distinct, a distinct advantage. Indian civilization, in many ways, is unique. It is not only an ancient civilization, but it is one that is not rooted in being caught in the past. It uses the confidence of its experience of the past as a fulcrum, as a stepping stone to the future. And it then marks its vaulting ambition and aspiration through the various manifestations of its own civilization. Art and culture is a very important aspect of the way India has always evolved. Our way of life, our philosophy has manifested itself in our creativity, our uh, creation of uh, the various facets that are now striking examples. In a world that is very rapidly changing around us, with technology assuming a much greater role, social forms undergoing rapid transformation, it is a certain sense of constancy that one looks for, a certain sense of holistic approach. And all this is something that Indian culture and civilization provides. I'm very delighted to introduce to you a very, very distinguished panel coming from the US, Canada, UK, the Netherlands, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and from Trinidad and Tobago, apart from our experts from India. May I set the ball rolling by requesting Mr. Balram Singh to speak about diaspora as a channel of soft power projection through culture. May I request, since we are behind the schedule, that you restrict yourself to five to six minutes. I shall probably give you a slight notice at the end of five minutes. Over to you, Professor Bal Ram Singh. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bhattacharya. I appreciate your uh, remarks and I'm very grateful to have this opportunity. Can I please have someone to allow me to share my slides? I come from a science background and generally have, have some evidence to talk about what I want to talk about, but it has been wonderful, and you uh, had a very nice comment to make, which is, I think, very uh, important, that the fact that India is a, a culture of integrated Samadra Jeevan, uh, what we call a Samadra Jeevan, and that is the best um, represented by uh, some of the practices that we have in India and what some of us have carried with us. In, the, um, in in wherever we now live. 
Uh, can can people see my slide? No. And, and I think the, the comment that was made by honorable uh, honorable minister about um, the largest second largest diaspora is very important to know that even the second diaspora, but they are the number one uh, uh, diaspora that in terms of remittance, the number one diaspora is Chinese. Diaspora and they are number one in FDI, whereas the Indian uh, diaspora is number one in remittance. Which basically means that we care about India uh, automatically. You know, there is the data data uh, for that. So that is very important. And the second one is that I'm speaking from a, a bit of holistic. Uh, what you you said, Sanjay Bhattacharya ji, that the uh, a bit of holistic approach that India has, and that's something as a scientist I've been able to. To feel and monitor, and that is uh, an idea of Ayurveda. Before I go there, uh, last uh, my book uh, was released, pre-publication book was released uh, called A Different Take, an NRI view of India in tradition of Ram Krishna and Gandhi. And this is a little bit different approach than what I heard this morning. That of course, you know, we bring the culture uh, that we have been uh, there in the past. Uh, where, wherever uh, our place of birth or motherland, but we also reflect back. And when we are uh, away from it, we reflect back and we reflect back to uh, on India. And this is the, the view that this book uh, uh, refers to, whereby Mahatma Gandhi even reflected back on India only when he left India. And so uh, Ram and Krishna, this is the, the not time to discuss about the book. I want to go ahead and talk about Ayurveda. Ayurveda is a very integrative of, uh, uh, approach to life. It has uh, season, it has environment, it has uh, individual, it has mind, it has society, uh, psychology, all everything. And you know what we eat, how we eat, and how we cook. And you know, uh, Dr. Prashad was talking about all the musical and performance, culture and food, etc. Liberations. All this is very much integrated. It's integrated in every almost society to a certain degree. But India is just and probably an expert in this, and that is something that uh, we need to think about. Because why we want to think about? It? Because this is Ayurveda is just not a, a life uh, experience. It's not just a culture. It's a more than a culture. It's a deeper uh, scientific, uh, psychological, medical. Health issues integrated with it, so it becomes very relevant to people. So when we look at from that point of view, then when we live naturally, then then we are healthy, and if we don't we start uh, we have the disbalance in that, then we have become bikriti or we become sick, and that is something even very relevant. Even like that in India has uh, rural India particularly has almost no COVID, or at least there is not that much death compared to anything else even in India. It just speaks of the, the culture of lifestyle, the food, and how we accommodate with the, uh, with the nature. And a lot of those are uh, in, in our uh, culture as, as we, we practice them. But what I wanted to do is put this in, in the perspective of, um, if I can get this going. Yeah, there we go. So uh, it went a little faster here. So we have um, a vesti and samasti concept in India, and it is part of India philosophy and also part of Ayurveda and that has it starts with the individual then society and then environment and what we have been able to do in the United States at least and, uh, and Dr. Sahasra Buddha was part of this one of the conferences that you see around the on the right uh, where we, we were able to talk about Ayurveda and how we can help the society all over the world not just in in um, in the United States or in India, but all over the world, and people from all over the world came and participated in this conference. And this is uh, organized by Boston Center of Excellence, which is a, a conglomerate of uh, uh, institutions, about 26 of them, that include, for example, in India, All India Institute of Medical Science, or JNU, and in, in the United States, some names that you might recognize, MIT and Harvard, and Baylor College of Medicine, and University of Massachusetts. They are part of it. And so we are really already working and, and bringing the help to the world. And, and then I heard about the education as one of the areas Dr. Sahasri did mention. And here is a, 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 a Oberoi Foundation that runs every year teacher training program. We go to high school teachers and teach them how to teach about India in a classroom that has a huge multiplier effect because every uh, kid here goes to high school and then this is the 
many more than 50 percent of them probably the only chance that they hear about india so that that the integration is very important and then only we can go to semester which of course include the whole uh, universe and uh, india is the one country and culture uh, that talks about the whole universe as part of us and and that one is the idea is uh, in science call system and surrounding but in case of uh, philosophy is called yat pindita brahmande so this is exactly in practice yat pindita brahmande and then i want to just talk about with this background there is a the tradition of world order and henry kissinger wrote recently a book on to publish in 2014 where he talks about world order and he talk, in the india is not mentioned by the way in this europe is mentioned china is mentioned islamic countries are mentioned and united states is mentioned india does not count in the world order and there was a book by chomsky noam chomsky he also does not have india as part of it he talks about more of communist and leftist and right it is an imperialist and capitalist and so he think that is is very important then of course there is a, a class of similages a uh, civilization by samuel huntington who also talks about more in re religious terms and there's talk about hindus buddhist and, and part of india and that had not been taken that well because of the it may have an implication of religious component uh, connotation and so i suggest and propose and we have been working on Professor yes, Singh, I, uh, I hate to about. interrupt you one minute more. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I read the yoga world order that we can uh, have, and uh, uh, and that's something that we are talking about. That the, because of the integrated approach, this is very important, and that has uh, love, relationship, friendship, attitude. All that is very important part of that. It also has a very different idea. The professor Pangaria talked about uh, reverse innovation. it has education as ayurveda is part of classroom education that we go to the classrooms and then there is a, a something called national association the national ayurvedic medical association and that uh, holds these meetings every year and so there is already you know talking about community involved with it. this is a, a mostly 90% of those people are um, people and american community not indian american community so i think with those kind of things we are able to do what i think uh, is intended here to be done and recently the minister of uh, health was part of it he did talk about entire planet as a family but sudhay kutumbakam that we heard today also but he also talked about nationalism my feeling uh, is that uh, 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 they have other speakers uh, who are waiting uh, to come in line 10, 10 seconds 10 seconds so so in, i what i'm trying to say that india should have not this national jab international jab because of the good income and we are here uh, to help indian diaspora is here to help thank you thank you professor singh for a wonderful overview of uh, the way things are the way india sees culture the holistic approach we now move to canada with uh, lata pada who is a dance exponent she teaches bharatanatyam and this is the softer skills and the softer arts so it's over to you lata lata are you online yes i am can you hear lata, me lata it's over to you <clears throat> Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, namaskar and my pranams to all the respected guests assembled for the conference. And I'm truly very honored to have been invited to speak at this prestigious conference. I also wanted to say that it was my distinct honor to have received the Pravasi Bharatiya Samman from President Pratibha Patil in January 2011. I'm from Canada and I founded Sampradaya Dance Creations, uh, a premier Bharatanatyam training and performance dance company 31 years ago uh, in Canada. I moved to Canada 55 years ago. Today, uh, Sampradaya Dance Creations is recognized as Canada's leading Indian performing arts organizations as well as a promoter of Indian dance and music. it has won several awards for its dance productions 
which are recognized for excellence, innovation, and aesthetics. And our productions have toured internationally, including India, on several occasions. Uh, over the past 55 years, my efforts have always been directed towards the promotion and dissemination of the highest quality of dance training and performance, and very importantly, for demystifying the prevalent misconceptions that Indian classical dance forms are of a musical, a museum quality, static and unchanging, and that they are of a folk tradition. My advocacy work in this area has been strategic and sustained, both with the public, the arts community, and most importantly, with the government funders to break the barriers of inclusivity and access to public funding. In an arts policy environment about 30 years ago, which was dominantly Eurocentric and which supported arts projects that fit Western aesthetics, it took several decades of persistent lobbying, explaining the depth, the rigor, the beauty of Indian classical dance, inviting observers to our classes and performances that the, finally the understanding and the appreciation grew. Gradually, the awareness increased that the Indian classical dance forms of India were not folk traditions, but a well-defined pedagogical system which was progressive, well-documented, and had a robust theoretical system to support it. In fact, I must highlight that after all these efforts, Canada is to be applauded now for its arts policy, which is progressive, inclusive, and equitable in supporting the arts of immigration immigrant cultures. As a result, Sampradaya dance is supported by Canadian federal, provincial, and municipal funders on a multi-year operational funding system for its artistic, administrative, and training initiatives. The rapidly changing immigration patterns in Canada around the 1990s and early 2000s was a clear marker of shifting demographics and a large influx of educated professionals from India with artistic backgrounds. Many of them came from established dance and music careers in teaching and performance and took no time in setting up their careers, artistic careers across Canada. Very quickly, these teachers became the custodians of classical traditions, imparting training to hundreds of young Indo-Canadians adhering to the highest, strictest levels of training of Carnatic and Hindustani music schools, Bharatanatyam, Kathak, Odissi, Manipuri, and Mohiniyattam training institutions proliferated here in Canada. Now see, one sees a remarkable uh, array of dance and music classes all over the large cities in Canada and several thousands of youngsters taking a keen interest in achieving proficiency to the highest level. The quality and caliber of teachers here in Canada is truly impeccable, and they are to be commended for their training and passion in uh, the young students and the quality that they are coming out with. Concerts are held throughout the year, dance performances all over, and arangetrams of a very high quality are a regular future. South Indian and North Indian cultural organizations hold annual festivals and performance series presenting local and visiting artists from India. All the above <clears throat> point out to the fact that the Indian guys. Diaspora... You have one minute more. Sorry? You have one minute more. Sure. sure. All the above points out the fact that the Indian diaspora in Canada is very deeply entrenched. <laughs> Indian values, cultural traditions, with a strong respect and appreciation. So what I would suggest is that we could consider Videshi Kalakar type of festivals for cross-exchange between India 
and Canada, special scholarships, special commissions for collaboration between new generation artists from India and Canada. Could we consider perhaps a Yuva Pravasi Bharatiya Award for young artists between uh, in the diaspora because there are so many brilliant artists. So again, I thank you for giving this opportunity to me to share my thoughts and to be part of this important discussion. Namaskar. Lata, thank you so much for your uh, presentation and a lot of very good ideas. What a trailblazing, blazing path you have led in Canada in bringing culture to the people, to the young people, and spreading what India means in the most beautiful way. And we also take note of the many good ideas that you've mentioned about the way forward. Thank you. We now move to UK to Dr. M. N. Nandakumar, a scholar, researcher of classical arts and Sanskrit, also a leading founder of the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan in UK. We now invite Dr. Nandakumar for his views. Namaste to everybody from all of us here at the Bhavan London. From the 60s through to the late 90s, access to Indian culture in all its forums, arts, languages, music, yoga, food, faith, in the UK was largely to keep the Indian diaspora connected with the country of their origin. The presentation of all these was typically by Indians for Indians and it served, and it served an important and much needed purpose. I think it's important to state that one of the reasons that the Indian community has thrived in the UK is because of the efforts of the diaspora to establish this cultural base and cultural accessibility that made the process of settling in a different country more agreeable. This could be seen as the initial role of the diaspora in the promotion of Indian culture abroad, ensuring that Indians moving abroad were able to stay connected to their own heritage, giving a sense of being at home, away from home. The Bharati Vidya Bhavan's role in supporting this initial period was to provide access to the best teaching and performances in Indian classical arts. Moving into the 21st century, the requirements of the Indian diaspora have changed. The second generation Indians had now reached adulthood and were starting families of their own. For these, their identity spanned their Indian and British roots. They sought how these two rich facets could not just coexist in independence, but form an integrated, cooperative, and reinforcing combination. So the framing of Indian culture altered so that it could be seen in the context of Britain's overall cultural fabric. It was important for the diaspora to understand its place in this mix and be able to articulate this position and ensure it was presented in a way that complemented this state. This was the period in which we saw by osmosis Indian culture being increasingly seen in the mainstream. The crossing over had very much taken hold. As the needs of the, the Indian diaspora evolved, so did the way the Bhavan supported this transition. A greater focus and validation from external national bodies, an increase in projects that brought Indian classical arts together with arts from outside India, educational programs in schools. As we reach the third decade of the century, friends, Indian arts are very much part of the cultural fabric of the United Kingdom. To quote former Prime Minister David Cameron, it puts the great into Great Britain. And while the needs that existed in the two stages previously described continue to be relevant, the real focus now is on how the beauty, depth, and richness of India's great traditions can be made relevant, accessible, and appealing to everyone regardless of their ethnicity. The goal is to become a truly pervading, fully integrated part of this rich tapestry. As history has shown, a strong understanding Appreciation and love for one other, another culture helps in developing relationships beyond just the cultural, a key point that leaders across the board have echoed. To quote a Sanskrit verse, I am Nijaha Paro Veti, Ganana Lahu Chetasam, Udara Charita Anamtu Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. This one is ours, 
This is not ours. This kind of discrimination, friends, is found only amongst narrow-minded people. But for those who are noble and broad-minded, the whole world is one family, not just one family, one small family. So where does the Bharati Vidya Bhavan fit into this? Nabhavan has been providing educational programs in classical Indian art forms, languages, and yoga for almost 50 years. We deliver over 100 classes a week in more than 20 subjects, now fully online. There is ever-increasing interest from non-Indians who find something unique in our practices that resonates with them, whether this is philosophy, literature, architecture, singing, dance, or yoga, this spark of interest needs careful nurturing of if it is to yield light and warmth. Sa vidya ya vimuktaye, that is real wisdom, art, which renders one free from all kinds of bondages. Friends, our position is to promote the cultural treasure of India, not just for members of the diaspora. We love that the diaspora feel a connection to the Indian arts. It is something we wholeheartedly value alongside our core intention, which is to open to each and every person who is interested in Indian arts, regardless of their own background. Friends, it has been an adventure in faith aimed to the good of all. Namaste. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to represent Bharati Vidya Bhavan and its work. Jai Hind, Vande Mataram, Namaste. Dr. Nandkumar, thank you for your views. Uh, they are so illuminating. You talked about how dual identity people can coexist in this understanding of Vasudeva Kutumbakam. The amazing work that Bharti Vidya Bhavan does across the country and in many countries across the world is inspiring and perhaps a a fitful flag bearer of the Indian civilization. Thank you very much for your views. Pravasis, we now move to the Netherlands. Our next panelist is Mr. Rabin Baldeo Singh. Mr. Baldeo Singh was the former mayor of The Hague. He comes from Suriname and has had deep interest in Bhojpuri language, has created documentaries, and has been a beacon of the connections between Indian culture and the countries and lands that he's lived in. Mr. Robin Baldeo Singh. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, thank you for having me on uh, this conference. It's an honor to participate. Uh, you know, indeed, I uh, do live in the Netherlands and uh, one should know that the Netherlands uh, has an inhabitant of almost a quarter of a million people of Indian descent, you might say. And with that figure, uh, yeah, uh, the Netherlands hosts actually the largest Indian diaspora community on the European mainland. Uh, so that is, I think, something which has to be kept in, in mind. So what we see here is that they are spread all over major cities, like indeed The Hague, the International City of Peace and Justice, Amsterdam, Rotterdam. Um, uh, the whole metropolitan area. And what you see is that culture itself, the Indian culture, is very vividly present uh, uh, and, and it is dynamic. Um, but the problem is that we have to take into account the history of our migration. You know, most of the people living in the Netherlands come from Suriname, South America, and they are the descendant of the Indian indentured laborers who came actually from Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. Um, these people have a cultural heritage which goes back to this Bhojpuri culture or this Bihari culture, you might say. Um, uh, so indeed, the, the, the Indian culture, uh, the mainstream culture is very vividly present here in the Netherlands. Vividly cultural meaning, of course, the Indian cinema, uh, Bollywood films, uh, but also yoga, uh, music and all. But the challenge which lay ahead is how to cope with this heritage culture. And that is what indeed I am very much interested in because what I see nowadays is that because of the mainstream culture, this heritage culture is actually declining. 
uh, it is oppressed, you might say. Uh, um, and that is a little bit uh, worrying, uh, uh, I must say. So we have a treasure of culture brought from, you know, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, to the plantations, the sugarcane plantations, etc., in Suriname, and it came from 1975 onwards to the Netherlands, still vividly present. It is popular culture, but the support, there is a lack of support in developing all this. Uh, one of the aspects of this culture is indeed language. You might be surprised, you know, that Indian and Niger laborers went to uh, Mauritius, South Africa, Fiji, Guyana, Trinidad, but also to Suriname, and from Suriname to the Netherlands, of course. Uh, only in the Suriname and in the Netherlands, this language is spoken very widely. So I can still speak the, a variation of this Bhojpuri Audi language, very vividly present. People grow, uh, people, you know, are brought up in this language. But the problem is, and I'm really very proud that we have in The Hague, uh, the Gandhi Center, a beautiful center doing lots of good work, sponsored by the ICCR. But what you see is that indeed you will find there the main mainstream culture, so yoga, uh, classical music, and whatever. But the popular culture which we have, there is no place for that to promote. So what you see is that the language which uh, I have, we call it Sarnami language, very much connected to the Bhojpuri and Audi language, a kind of sister language, is indeed declining. And, you know, this Bharti, this Girmitya Bhojpuri, I'm very troubled about that. So I think what, what should do, and I hope that, you know, this conference will enable us, you know, to do more on the exchange of culture program. And the exchange should be a, a sponsor research of the heritage culture and of the language, for example, in order to preserve that. Uh, and I think it would be very fine to start with connecting with the universities here, uh, to enabling a chair, for example, a university chair, uh, to do research, uh, to do preservation of uh, this uh, uh, culture and to enable people to get educated in it. So um, uh, sponsoring research and preservation uh, is indeed activating the promotion of culture, but I don't mean the culture which is the mainstream culture, but the culture which is important for a quarter of a million people here in the Netherlands. There is indeed one big challenge uh, to conclude my presentation with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, is that how to enable our mainstream and popular culture, you know, to, uh, to how to enable others than the diaspora community to get to know uh, it uh, with this. And that is a challenge. In 2023, we're going to celebrate the 150th anniversary of our Immigration Day. And uh, we're working now towards a huge program with museums, with theaters, and with the universities. And perhaps that can be an opening for you guys, you know, to help us to get through to this Dutch mainstream audience, you might say. And that is indeed what I hope that 2023 will enable us to do. To conclude, indeed, we are doing quite well. The culture is very vividly present. The Indian diaspora community is a very vibrant community, but there is a challenge as far as the popular uh, heritage culture is concerned and the language is concerned, which is widely celebrated, but still uh, uh, it is a little bit you know, under attack, you might say, or oppressed, and we have to tackle that in the near future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mr. Baldev Singh, for your uh, comments. In fact, you brought out a very important point of how language is the ultimate code and how it carries the genetic material in a more vibrant way than anything else. Uh, I myself recall during my stay in Northern Europe as to how I came across various Surinamese friends who would try out their version of Hindi with me. And I would find that it was a language that I was not fully familiar with. And I know exactly what you're saying. And that's what brings up the very strong need for connections and exchanges. Your idea for 2023 is something that we would definitely like to take up and see how we can take that forward. Thank you so much for your very valuable insights on the subject. Pravasis, we now move across the Atlantic once again to the beautiful islands of St. Vincent and the Grenadines.
and we have with us Dr. Arnold Norman Thomas. Dr. Arnold Norman Thomas is a diplomat, professor, a strong researcher on diaspora affairs, and has contributed extensively to this subject. Dr. Norman Thomas, the floor is yours. Dr. Thomas, are you online? Uh, would you like to unmute yourself and come online? Dr. Thomas, uh, we can't hear you. Would you like to unmute and come online? Uh, Dr. Thomas, we can't seem to get the connection from you. Would you wish to unmute and start? Dr. Thomas, we are not able to hear you. Um, I think we can move to the next speaker and then uh, probably we'll come back to Dr. It Thomas. Seems, uh, we're having some technical issues at Dr. Thomas's end. May we now move again in the Caribbean to the beautiful Trinidad and Tobago. We have with us Dr. Satnarayan Palkar Singh. Dr. Satnarayan is an author. He's active on the stage. He's formed the Kathak Kala Sangam, and was also a public servant. Dr. Satnarayan, we look forward to hearing your views. You may unmute and come online, please. You hearing me? Yes, we are. Thank you, Dr. Satnarayan. Come on, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, conference organizers, distinguished speakers, fellow panelists, Greetings from Trinidad and Tobago. It is an honor to be invited to share on this topic, the role of Indian diaspora in promotion of Indian culture abroad. I speak as an economist, an educator, international performing artist for over 50 years, and an author. Based on an expansive definition of culture, those Indian ancestors who departed India over the centuries have done significant work in creating in the new environments, representing their cultural heritage, traditions, festivals, and arts. Knowledge and industries have grown out of these. This is not to discount the significant direct efforts and assistance by Indian independent in the over recent times, let's say the last 60 years, which is relatively recent in terms of Indian diasporic history. I go straight into offering recommendations for the promotion of Indian culture abroad. Education and training, engaging the youth. Indian scholarships should continue to be offered to youths to study at accredited Indian universities and technical institutes. The government of India should promote online education and training courses in appropriate fields, leading to certification, degrees, diplomas, in the Indian diaspora, and I am talking about education and training across the board in many disciplines. This facilitates home studies during this time of uncertainty and COVID. It encourages fraternal bonds to student alumni associations in India and abroad, not to mention the networking that would develop. Um, improving cultural exchange through the performing arts. The government of India must continue offering scholarships, especially to youths to pursue training in India in the creative and performing arts. You can facilitate the establishment of online databases 
of those scholars, including artists, to share information and facilitate ongoing interaction. This has been mentioned um, just now. Recognitions. Indian foreign missions and embassies in promoting Indian culture abroad should identify India trained leading persons in their diasporic countries, academics, creative and performing artists, etc., who continue to make significant contributions to Indian culture and recommend public awards and recognitions by Indian academic technical institute and even the government of India to such persons for excellence or long and distinguished service in their respective fields, improving cultural exchange through the performing arts. And this is now ICCR. ICCR should consider restructuring its teaching and training programs at the Indian cultural centers abroad to achieve the following. Engage the normal teaching classes, plus doing short training courses with established local teaching community come performing institutions, including, and this is important, non-Indian institutes in the host countries. It will build appreciation for the Indian arts, Indian thought pattern, learning, and enhance training and performing capacities in those inst institutions. Tutors and senior administrators, administrators at Indian cultural centers must be properly debriefed on their role and function in the revised trust to promote pluralism, youth development, improving cultural exchange in the countries to which they are allocated. ICCR support to Indian tertiary level institutions involved in diaspora studies and faculties in India. And this has been alluded to today. Several Indian universities have now begun researching Indian diaspora studies. Yet there's an absence of high quality, contemporary, appropriate, and I'm using my region now, West Indian literature in the libraries of some of these Indian universities. I have lectured in some of those institutions and I know what they have and what they don't have. Uh, Naipaul still seems to be the most important piece of work they have there. We need to go way beyond that. ICCI must develop a catalog of such reading matter and facilitate their transfer to those relevant libraries in India to support research and publication. Arrange exchange visits. ICCR should arrange exchange visits of academics, researchers, sports persons, social workers, and artists of the diaspora to share experiences, that is lectures, lecture demonstration, and short period attachments in appropriate Indian universities and training institutes and vice versa to be back and forth. It will create appreciation for the efforts of the diaspora and of its PIOs for Indian cultural development and promotion already taking place. This will influence cooperation, promote peace, tolerance, pluralism, non-violence and progressive thinking process. This conference come at an, a critical and opportune time for refashioning a post-COVID world. A strategically planned and implemented, both India and the Indian diaspora are well poised to build a more equitable socio-economic and cultural edifice and bolster democracy in re, by redirecting education, training, and technological change, and using its soft power to build new institutions and a new and a bolder world. Vasudha, Dr. Sutterman, you have another 30 seconds to wind up, please. Thank you. I thank you again for this opportunity and await your comments and questions. I am within my time frame. Thank you. Dr. Satnayan, thanks so much for a wonderful exposition. It was so illuminating. The importance that you attached on academics and academic exchanges is something that will drive these relations forward. As we look ahead, and you also mentioned about the establishment of chairs, several suggestions for ICCR. My friend, uh, the Director General uh, of ICCR is sitting at the other end, and I'm sure he's taken serious note 
of your suggestions. I'm, but I'm, I'm, concerned. I'm also dealing with academics in the arts too. Huh? They absolutely. Fit, you know, across the board. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what we should really push for. Thank you so much for your valuable suggestions. I'm told that Dr. Arnold Norman Thomas from the St. Vincent, Vincent and the Grenadines is now online. Can I invite Dr. Thomas to come online? Unmuted, please come online, please. Dr. Thomas, are you there? Well, sorry. You picked up on exactly what you were alluding to. Yes, Dr. Thomas, please come on. It appears uh, we are continuing to have trouble in the connectivity in the St. Vincent's and the Grenadines. Uh, meanwhile, I shall move on to Professor Chandrasekhar Bhatt, uh, an academic sociologist of great repute who has worked extensively on diaspora studies and has contributed enormously to the work that has been done in India, uh, leading light. Uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Bhatt, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary uh, Matacharji and uh, Chair of the session and very distinguished panelists. I see uh, our friend uh, Satnarayanji here and uh, many others around uh, with whom I had a greater privilege of uh, interacting. I, I hope to see Arnold. Hopefully he will come. And uh, uh, let me, before I start my presentation, let me also thank uh, for this global privilege that I have uh, got today to the MEA, ICCR, and uh, ARSP for, uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity, and especially uh, Ambassadors Gu Virendra Gupta and uh, Anup Mudgal, and also Secretary General Sham Prande. My presentation is beyond mutual linkages and expectations. Now, why I emphasize this term is to get back to the foundations we started in 2000, the high-level committee uh, were formed by um, L.M. Singhvi and uh, other members, and the kind of contributions they made uh, in terms of uh, recommendations. And Pravasi Day is one of the major recommendations they have done, which has been implemented extensively right from the day one, from 2003 onwards. And uh, we have been having it every year for a couple of years, and then we have it uh, once in two years, and I had a great privilege of uh, attending it, a cultural continuity linkage that we had at Benares uh, Pravasi Day uh, program in 20. 19. Um, then, um, man, now the theme that I want to speak is first uh, about what is Indian culture, Indianness and culture, and then move on to what Indian diaspora has done all the way already and what it can do for future in terms of promoting Indian culture. Because it is through the diaspora as a leverage we can extend India far beyond India through all the locations world over. So first is uh, to talk on uh, the Indianness, Indian culture. Now what the Indianness is uh, something which is unique, which perhaps you don't find any other parts of the world. And it's uh, uh, many sociologists and anthropologists have tried to analyze the content of what is Indianness. And uh, uh, they found there's nothing very tangible to see in terms of Indianness, but it, mostly it is manifested in intangible qualities of absorption, of inclusiveness, of tolerance, of spiritualism, and a belief in the whole universe as a family. And I may 
repeat again whatever has been repeated several times even in this session that uh, we believe India, Indianness believes in Vasudeva Kutumbakam. And one more aspect, the happiness of all, namely Sarve Janaha Sukhino Bhavantu. We look forward that everyone in the world is part of us. Everyone should be happy, just as everyone is part of our family. So with this uh, basic idea of uh, Indianness, let me go forward. And this has specifically the idea of absorption, idea of reshaping, and so on. So the whole Indian civilization is a part of uh, uh, absorbing and reshaping. And the Indian civilization and culture that we have inherited has uh, qualities of tolerance and also spirituality. And we exist in unity and diversity. So we at the heart of Indianness is the unity in diversity. So all the Indian diaspora communities, wherever they are located, they are in multi, uh, uh, multicultural context, just as India has been in the largest multicultural context. We have varieties of uh, people here, language, uh, religion, caste, and everything you may see, including our racial stock here. We, we differ from one another, but we are all one. There's one thing that's specific with us that we carry that oneness, idea of oneness wherever we go. This is what I call as uh, Indianness, Indianness, which has gone beyond India, along with all the people who have gone right from the day one who travel by jahaj, jahajis. And uh, jahajis are the ones- I just wanted to say we have one minute more. Okay, Jahajis have gone through extensively, lot of struggle, and they retain the culture. I must commend the way in which they have retained the culture. I had the great opportunity of uh, visiting um, um, Madam uh, Sandhya uh, Vindya Swarnis uh, Guyana, a multicultural situation, a very colorful situation of Pagua. I had a privilege of uh, visiting in 2019. And uh, what I like to emphasize is the kind of education. Education is in the forefront of promoting Indianness, Indian culture. So if we get the right kind of education from the beginning, it will perhaps all go well to maintain Indian culture and uh, its continuity. So we, I found a school in Trinidad, in uh, Guyana, the uh, school called uh, Saraswati Vidya Niketan, which is uh, distinguished in terms of academic excellence, along with imparting Indian cultural values and so on. So we have uh, uh, such situation, such schools to be developed all over the world. And uh, I wish uh, Vidya Bhavan, uh, etc. they are not really important. Uh, we are as, running out of time. Could I, could I add a little more, please? 10 seconds. Uh, yeah, okay, right. Uh, I wish to mention that there have been a number of uh, institutions like um, uh, Madam uh, Vindya Pasini established the Hindu Sabha, and we have in Trinidad similar such uh, um, Arisman Sabhas running a number of schools imparting Indian culture. Now, these need to be extended. Well, lot to the large number of people. And thank, I thank you, you for Dr. Pat, for your... Thank you, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Tremendous. For, for the range of views and uh, very, very instructive and how the Indian philosophy combines with our civilization and culture in taking the message forward. I now have the pleasure to invite uh, Rama Vidyanathan, uh, who is an extremely well-known dance exponent of the Bharatanatyam uh, style. Uh, she has performed and presented uh, across the world and uh, obviously is extremely well endowed in terms of projection of Indian culture, both within the country and overseas as a guru and as a performer. Rama Vadyanathan, the floor is yours. Namaskar. Thank you, Sanjayji. I'm extremely delighted and honored to be part of this discussion. And 
my talk will specifically target the youth of the diaspora because I think they are the future global citizens. And it is that section of the community that is maximum in contact with the outside world and with other cultures. So I think for sustained efforts, it is extremely imperative to engage the youth. And in my several, several years of visiting the countries in the Western part of the world, not just for performances, but also for workshops and lecture demonstrations and master classes and one to one teaching sessions and residency programs where everybody stays under the same roof and you know learns and studies and practices together in my experience i have noticed that youngsters who are introduced to indian arts their whole life changes the way they think the way they behave even the way they walk the way they dress when they come into contact with indian arts and indian culture there is a life-changing experience that goes through them. I've seen these youngsters, you know, they would be speaking English with an accent, with a non-Indian accent, but when they walk into the Bharatanatyam classroom, they are as devoted and the demeanor changes completely like anybody else in India. So I see the dedication that these youngsters have to dance because when they start learning dance, they are introduced into a magical world of poetry and literature, of Indian paintings, sculpture, textiles, philosophy, mythology, metaphors. And they come into contact of, into all of this and there is an identity that gets nurtured within them. And they start enjoying and they, they start getting feeling proud of Indian culture. I think that is most important. We need to engage the youth so that, so that there, is, there is an identity of Indianness that's nurtured within them and they not only understand and enjoy Indian culture, but they also feel proud about it because only then will they be convincing ambassadors of Indian culture in the world because they will come from a point of conviction. I say this because they ask me so many questions and it is important to listen to them. Yes. I was once teaching the Rasa Leela where Krishna dances with many gopis. One of them turned around and asked me, why does Krishna have so many girlfriends? And I had to demystify the whole thing and tell them that it is not just about Krishna dancing with the gopis. It is a metaphor to tell us that there is just one Supreme Consciousness and we are all manifestations of that Supreme Consciousness. And all the gopis, they actually represent all of us. And therefore, each gopi thought Krishna is dancing only with her. And that means each one of us needs to have our own personal, individual relationship with God. And that is what it means. So then I understood that Understanding Indian culture is not just to celebrate Diwali, wear Indian clothes and dance the Garba. It is actually to understand that Indian culture and tradition is ancient, but it is also contemporary. We need to make Indian arts relevant for today. And I think as teachers and as scholars and teachers and institutions, uh, that propagate Indian arts um, in the West. We need to understand that we need to make the arts relevant for today for them. And we also must tell them that this is a dance form that they're learning. It is a medium to explore. It is a language to explore. They can explore, they can explore any theme with this. It is not necessary that they only have to explore mythological and religious themes with this. So what happens is when I give them the freedom of understanding and 
using the, the dance form in a medium that they want to, then they find relevance to it. And then they get more and more attracted to the dance form. So in my view, I think it is extremely important to engage in the youngsters and teach them the Indian culture and tradition as relevant as it is for today. I'll end with, um, with a very beautiful um, experience of, of what I've had with several organizations in uh, the US. There is Tatva Masi in Texas run by Shruti Mohan. There is Navatman in New York. Uh, and of course, Lata Ji is here and like her, there are so many organizations in North America and in Europe. And I noticed that a lot of these organizations are run by youngsters and they try to engage the youngsters as much as possible, not just telling them that this is the right thing to do, but also to tell them why this is the right thing to do? What is the metaphor behind it? What is the symbolism behind it? We do Ardhana Arishura Ashtakam, where we speak about Lord Shiva, where half his body is male and half is female. Now we need to tell them, this is the earliest reference to gender equality. This is to tell us, 2000 years ago, this was mentioned by Adi Shankaracharya. And I think this was the earliest reference to gender sensitivity, which actually happened in India. So we need to tell them, Ardhanari Shwara is not about Shiva having two halves of one male and one female, but it is also about telling the world that man and woman have to work in tandem, complementing each other, and only then will... Rama, can we say together. one more minute? Thank you so much. So I will just end with, uh, uh, um, with saying that these wonderful youngsters work so hard, they need to be integrated into mainstream dance, Indian dance. So I would urge many organizations, because I know ICCR is already doing it, but I would, I would urge organizations in India who curate festivals to include these youngsters and these teachers from, from the Indian diaspora and bring them into the mainstream dance world. Thank you. Namaskar. Yes, Thank you. Thank you, Ramaji, for your uh, presentation and the wonderful ideas that you've uh, suggested about how to connect uh, with the rest of the Pravasi community and how to project our culture. It's such an important element and such important work that you do. I find that Dr. Thomas is probably still not online. Uh, since he's not yet, is, is he online? No, not yet online. Uh, we seem to have lost connection with uh, Dr. Thomas in... Uh, with, with Dr. Thomas. Yeah, he's there, sir, yeah. Just see whether so he's... So may I invite by. Dr. Thomas to make his presentation? Yeah. Yes, Dr. Thomas, you're online. Can I? We can. Please, Dr. Thomas, continue. Uh, Dr. Thomas, can you switch off your video? Uh, because your audio is not very clear, uh, is it possible uh, you can switch off your video and let's see how your audio is? Okay, now uh, can we just uh, speak for a while? Sure. Not very clear. I think your audio is also not very clear. That's right. I put up my headphone. Let me try this one. Oh, my God. Give me noise. Give me noise. I think your audio is not very clear, so, so we are not able to hear you. Um, 
Well, dear Pravasis, it seems we do not have very good connectivity with St. Vincent's and the Grenadine. We were so looking forward to hearing the views of Dr. Thomas uh, and his perceptions on how we can strengthen uh, the connect with uh, the Indian diaspora. Um, we've had a number of very, very interesting suggestions from the panelists, a very distinguished panel, and uh, we have many, many lessons to learn that will take forward uh, this common endeavor of ours to connect more closely and engage the Indian community overseas. Uh, I now have the distinct pleasure of inviting Ambassador Anup Mudgal uh, to sum up the session. Dr. Mudgal. Thank you so much, Sanjay. Uh, I will just take a few minutes because a lot has already been said. Uh, Sanjay, it was a fascinating day. Uh, I don't know whether you could attend the morning session. I have been on this since morning. I, I have never seen such a convergence of ideas. Sanjay, when we were working on the concept for this conference, I was not sure what kind of convergence we will have in terms of ideas across the globe. And today, we had such wonderful conver convergence, I thought we were literally on the same page. There was a literal consensus about the importance of diaspora's role in promotion and preservation of Indian culture abroad. There was an appreciation about the role which the official channels could play by way of facilitation and support. And every speaker was trying to find a way to create a bridge between the, the facilitation by the official channels. I think we have Mr. Thomas again back online. And the role yeah. of the last spot. Uh, should I stop for a minute? Mr. Thomas, are you there? It <laughs> seems not, uh, Anup. Maybe you can continue. So, in fact, the speakers, every speaker was trying to give us a way forward how to bring these two channels together, which means the official channel, which is represented by our missions, our cultural centers, our cultural exchange program, and the various schemes, and the, the role the diaspora is playing. In fact, they made excellent suggestions. In fact, I thought after having dealt with promotion of Indian culture abroad for almost now 35, 36 years, uh, I was wondering whether we will get to see new ideas, but I was surprised to see wonderful new ideas. Sanjay, now the challenge is for us. We'll have to convert these ideas into actionable, actionable policy facilitation and framework. How to carry these ideas forward? These were not only excellent ideas, but these were very simple, doable, and effective ideas. So you will see when we when we prepare this report you will see this report will come as very handy for strengthening this connection between the official channels and the diaspora's role in preservation and promotion of culture abroad. So I saw there were some difficulties in connection. Some of our members could not really uh, make the presentations. Some of them didn't have sufficient time to do it. They wanted to say more things and we wanted to hear more but we were limited by, by time. I would want to request those members, please, in case you were not able to complete your presentation because of shortage of time, please send us your detailed ideas, either as an email or as the WhatsApp channel that we have. We would try to convert your ideas into actionable policy framework. And also I would want to say that this is only a step 
in a long series of interactions which we are planning with diaspora in terms of carrying forward these ideas. Please keep us on short leash and keep reminding us about your ideas and keep asking us where are we on that? Uh, when are we going to deliver on those ideas? I'm sure, Sanjay, you will agree with me that our objective is not only to listen to these ideas, but to convert these ideas into some kind of action. And that is what we are aiming to do. We'll stay in touch with you and uh, we look forward to working with you because the intention is very clear. clear. Not only talk, but walk the talk as we call it. On behalf of uh, DRRC, Sonja, I would want to thank everyone. Uh, I'm sure you must be recalling, I have been bothering all of you for one piece of information or the other, but it was for, for this beautiful conference. And we have a successful conference because you were always forthcoming in providing those inputs. I thank you very much. I thank everyone, literally, for having contributed to the success of this conference. Sanjay, over to you. Thank you. It's truly, and I think the kind of wealth of ideas that we have been able to get. I do see Dr. Thomas back. Would you like to come online, Dr. Thomas, if you can hear me? We'll give you one last shot. If you can't, then we would request you to send your message across and we'll have it played at the next session. Dr. Thomas. No, it does seem that we can't get through to Dr. Thomas despite our best efforts. Technology sometimes does come in the way, even in this digital age. I did also want to add that uh, there were a number of people who sent WhatsApp messages about various issues, including what are the metrics of uh, Indianness, uh, how far can yoga be used, and so on. Uh, I do thank all the uh, the contributors to the panel. Uh, you've been an outstanding set of panelists. Thank you so much for your contributions. As Anoop said, we would like to walk the talk, uh, work with you collaboratively in trying to get these ideas on the ground so that we have a deeper connect and a better understanding and appreciation of what India means to the rest of the world. Thank you very much for your attendance. Yeah, I think uh, we can conclude this uh, session. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all the participants. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, moderating this session. And uh, I thank Ambassador uh, um, also for working uh, up and uh, providing all assistance. Uh, so, uh, so we have had very some distinguished uh, uh, speakers and participants and panelists uh, in the session. And uh, on behalf of ICR, I thank uh, each and every one of you for uh, taking part uh, uh, in to this conference. Um, there has been a lot of work uh, uh, behind the scene and uh, so I think our team, uh, both from ICCR um, as well as AISP and from ministry, uh, especially from overseas um, Indian Affairs and um, Division, uh, worked very hard and uh, I thank uh, once again uh, all of you for participating in this uh, uh, conference today and uh, all these recommendations and uh, these aspects, what we have discussed over the um, uh, Almost a full day uh, will form part of uh, now the public convention on um, 9th of uh, January. So, thank you very much once again and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Hi, Arnold. Hello. <laughs> Uh, ah, okay. I thought uh, Miss, Mr. Thomas is opposite. <laughs> yeah. No, I think we tried our best, but we couldn't get him. I think so. There is some problem with his uh, audio, so we are not able to hear him. No, we'll ask him to send his uh, report uh, by email and we'll take on board his ideas.
Yeah, I think that is uh, so I think it's a good idea. So we can ask him yeah. uh, his, uh, his written text and then we can include that one in our report. Thank you very much. Thanks once again and have a wonderful day. Thanks.